vigilantes. Thank you for being with us today. And today we have the pleasure of having a returning guest, our first returning guest, Howard Shu himself, the creator of Random X, and also the creator of LMBD. And that's something I want to talk to you guys about today. I want to talk about both Random X and LMBD. And LMBD stands for Lightning Memory Map Database. And it's probably a, a, um, it's a piece of the puzzle in the makeup of Monero that a lot of people are not aware of. And I, I would like to talk about this so that everyone can learn a little bit more about the history of Monero. So, Howard, how are you doing and how did you get into Monero and what brought you into the community when you first discovered it? <laughs> hey, Ralph. Um, I'm doing great. You know, life in Ireland is good, but, you know, lockdown aside. Uh, how I got into Monero is actually through LMDB, uh, the reason that I got involved in the project. You know, uh, or as you may know, um, the original CryptoNote and Monero code base kept its blockchain entirely in RAM. They didn't have a database for it at all. And naturally, this was going to uh, become a, a strong limitation to how much the blockchain could grow. You know, if it had to fit completely in memory, then it would only, you know, grow to a certain size and it'd be done. So early on, uh, Fluffy Pony uh, started researching for database drivers that they could use to store the blockchain. And, you know, they apparently reviewed several of them before they, they hit on LMDB and Fluffy contacted me on IRC and said, hey, I'm looking at using your database. And I said, yeah, that's great. You know, have fun with it. And literally that was my only interaction with Monero uh, at the very beginning. That was around uh, 2015. And then much later uh, in 2016, <clears throat> they had gotten a lot of work done on integrating LMDB into their code base. Uh, there was a developer named uh, Warp Tangent who did most of that work. And um, he started to step back from the project and they were having some trouble with getting LMDB working on 32-bit windows. And so they contacted me again uh, for some help. And that's when I started to get more directly involved in things. So, you know, I showed them how to get a Windows build that was working and, you know, worked out a few kinks with uh, the data format to make sure that it was portable between Windows and Linux and things like that. But you know, that's, that's where it all started. So LMDB is still part of the uh, Monero infrastructure, correct? Yes. And, Does that in know, itself it, require like continual maintenance or is it just a standard protocol that is set and fixed? Uh, it's, it's fairly fixed, you know, that it's, I mean, the, the idea behind the design of LMDB is to be extremely low maintenance, you know, for the most part, it's zero maintenance. And then you gave us random X. So for all those people watching right now, they might not understand what we're talking about. So if you could please give people an, an understanding of what is random X and why it was created to begin with for Monero. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, be, before we leave the topic of LMDB though, I just wanted to point out, you know, um, before, before that integration, it, it took like 20 hours to sync the blockchain and it was only a million blocks. And after they integrated LMDB, it could do that sync in under one hour. So there was a huge impact on Monero's usability just from that. Wow, I did not know that. That's, that's thank you. Wow, <laughs> that's impressive. <laughs> that's, that's wild. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah, and I mean, you know, the people who were there from 2015, you know, saw that transition. I suppose everybody today just kind of takes it for granted. But yeah, that's that was an important uh, data point back then. So uh, Random X, um, the reason that it got created was, you know, back in late 2017 and 
early 2018, we started to realize that uh, mining ASICs were active on the Monero network. And uh, these ASICs were just outclassing the GPU miners that had been the dominant mining hardware up till that point. And you know, one of the principles in Monero, uh, which was also one of the early principles in Bitcoin is the idea of you know, one CPU equals one vote where we want you know, individual PC owners to have a voice in mining on the network. And these um, ASICs tend to be you know, large commercial ventures where they're deploying thousands of times more hash power than the typical PC. Uh, so, you know, they're, they're really disrupting the balance of power on the network. Uh, so, you know, just keeping to the original principles of the project, you know, Monero was designed to be or intended to be ASIC resistant from the very beginning. And so we, recently, we, yeah, recently I saw I saw a tweet of yours that regarded um, Monero's decentralization in terms of the amount of mining nodes on the network right now. And I, I, I saw those numbers and, and it was uh, pretty outstanding. Yeah, that's right. Um, so before the transition to RandomX, there were about 40,000 active miners. And you know, today, 18 months later, there's over 90,000. So the, you know, the increase in number of miners has been dramatic. Yeah, and to your point, you know, that just, that just shows how decentralization has grown and improved over the past 18 months. When you guys uh, went on to uh, launch RandomX, you guys were extremely careful. I remember speaking to you and you told me that you guys had four independent audits. That's right. Yeah. Can you please tell us more about this peer-reviewed process within Monero? Well, um, you know, as you can imagine, everybody was paranoid about making this kind of a change, right? If, if we change the proof of work algorithm and, and there's a bug in it or something goes wrong, you know, the entire network is hosed, right? So everybody was a little bit afraid to make this change, right? And so, you know, doing the four separate code audits was, um, was a way for us you know, to double or triple check our work and make sure, you know, that we had all the bases covered because, you know, we certainly didn't want to deploy it and then watch it blow up in our faces. <laughs> so these, uh, these audits were all community funded. Now, the very first one was actually funded by another project called Arweave, uh, who had been following our development of RandomX and they decided that they wanted to deploy it on their own network you know, again, because they had concerns about ASIC mining. So they actually uh, paid for the very first audit and they actually deployed RandomX on their network before we did on Monero. Uh, but the other three audits were all uh, funded by the Monero community. And um, two of the auditors were recommended to us because they had done an audit before on Ring CT. So a lot of uh, the Monero Research Lab guys were already confident in their uh, quality of work. That's awesome. If, I mean, so, um, so this is, Monero's growing and it's growing in its fan base and people really love the project overall. And I, I've started to hear a lot of desire within the community and newcomers to, uh, into the community that they want to implement and start looking into uh, funding their own peer-reviewed audits of code. What would you say to them? How, what, where, what, when, what direction would you point them to? Because they're, they're enamored with the project, with Monero, and they want to contribute to this peer-reviewed process. Um, you know, it's, it's like we tell any other contributor, you know, find a section of the code that interests you and just dive in. You know, there's, there's no, there's no barrier to entry. There's no gatekeepers on that. 
where is Random X now? And do you foresee? I, I remember that be, right before Random X was launched, there were a lot of uh, contingent game plans as to what could happen in the future. Now that we are far along into the future of Random X and we've seen how well it's operating, uh, what do you foresee for the future of the mining algorithm of, for, of Monero? And what place do you foresee Random X having in the near future and in, you know, as time goes on? Obviously, I'm speaking in regards to very um, vague uh, timelines, but uh, <laughs> I, 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 I'm pretty sure you have a, a, a more clear, uh, distinct historical horizon as to what is needed for the network than I do. So if you could please enlighten us, that'd be great. Yeah. Um, before the launch, we were talking about, you know, contingencies, as you mentioned, and one of them was, you know, if, if within the first year of deployment, we saw ASICs on the network that were, for example, uh, five to 10 times more efficient than CPUs, and we would consider that RandomX had failed and probably have migrated to SHA-3, right? So that was, that was the, the plan, the game plan as I understood it at that time. You know, so clearly here we are 18 months later, there are no ASICs. Uh, and so that contingency I, you know, is no longer on the table as far as I know. Uh, so for the foreseeable future, you know, we expect that RandomX in its current form will you know, perform as expected for about three to five years before technology has changed. You know, if you look at just the normal pace of um, advancement in CPU speed and memory speeds, you know, within three to five years, uh, PCs will be a lot faster. They'll have a lot more memory. You know, they'll have faster disks. And so at that time, you know, we'll probably need to look at retuning RandomX so that it's, you know, so that it's actually uh, difficult on those PCs, right? I mean, it's a proof of work algorithm. So the, the thing that makes it useful is that it's hard to compute, right? And so if five years from now, PCs are so fast that it becomes easy to compute, then we will probably need to tweak some of its parameters to make it a little harder to make it run a little longer, to make it use a little more memory, that sort of thing. It really um, fascinates me how Monero has defined the, um, the small blocker, Bitcoin small blocker approach in understanding what a, what a full node is, where Monero has been able to reconcile the argument in stating and in showing that a full node is a miner and that that minor full node is, is something that can be decentralized and that you yourself from home can run a, a complete full node as a miner. And I think that's just fascinating because it, it, it's a, it's an aspect of the Bitcoin scaling debate that Monero kind of, kind of just kind of drops the mic and says, well, this is kind of like the answer. And, <laughs> and so, which isn't it, isn't interesting though, because um I, Recently, saw an interview on Monero Talk uh, where with a BTC core dev, and he, it didn't seem like he saw that distinction. But uh, but it, I'm I'm really happy that in Monero people see the, the necessity of a full node being a miner, and for everyone to have that accessible. Do you ever foresee Monero leaving this modus operandi, this way of being of 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 just allowing proof of work to have a laissez-faire or uh, like a free market approach to have giving complete autonomy to miners or do you all do you foresee for to Monero, for Monero to always have this um this uh necessary approach of having to constrain the mining algorithm so that it is more fair so that more people can participate as miners I know. I think you know that's one of the principles that we want to hold on to as long as we can that you know mining should be as fair as possible should be accessible to as many people as possible and if things develop so that you know only 
special cartels have access to it, then you know I, that that in my mind would be a failure of our technology. You know? And and so let's let's talk. If I, I want to ask you a couple questions regarding, um, like theoretical Sybil attacks on the network. Um. Someone can make the argument that having more specialized mining hardware makes it harder to Sybil attack the network. And I've also heard the argument be made on the other extreme where it's like where it's it um, having less the opposite argument. I've, I've heard it uh, made as well, where um, not having specialized hardware makes it easier to Sybil attack the network. So. I think it's important for a lot of people watching this to realize that we're like when we're talking about Monero, we're not talking about Bitcoin and the game theory and the strategy that Bitcoiners have in in its in BTC and in the other forks. Monero has like its own, I, I would say Howard Shu, um, its own logic because there is a an end in mind. There is a goal which is to be private by default, and. And we need to protect the network on many levels from ever from it ever being taken over. So I know that there's people in Monero in its history that have said no miners should have more autonomy, but overall the community has always uh, come back to 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 where we're at now, where no miners need to be constrained so that everyone can operate as a complete full node miner, and so. The question is that I have for you is by making miner easier and more accessible, um, do you see a possibility for it to for Monero for the mining network of Monero to be Sybil attack since it's easier to mine Monero and since the the, the we, we're not depending on very specialized hardware like ASICs? Um the Monero network can be Sybil attacked, but that's that's not really a mining attack. You know, that's more of um, a verification or propagation attack where one node gets isolated from the real network and gets fed a lot of false information from the Sybil nodes. You know, that's uh, that's separate from the mining activity. You know, the miners. You know, as long as they are running the mining algorithm, you know, which they have to do to, to call themselves a miner, you know, they're doing useful work for the network. You know, so they're in that respect, you know, any miner is a good miner. I like that. So, yeah, um, if if anyone's uh, interested in mining, I would recommend uh, I would put some links in the description below. If you want to become a Monero miner, uh, I will, I will, I will link some so, some uh, tutorials and so forth, so you guys can uh, learn about that and engage in the network. Um, at this moment, I personally don't know how profitable mining is, depending on the cost of your electricity where you're at. Uh, Howard, do you have a, a maybe a clear understanding of mining profitability at this moment within the Monero network? Um. Yeah, you know, I, I can't give you any hard figures off the top of my head. I've seen, for example, somebody posted the other day that uh, they had bought a new AMD 3900X processor and they had been mining for you know a couple of months and it's almost paid for itself. So you know, you're looking at that kind of that kind of gain or that level of return, which is you know, a couple of months for a few hundred bucks. So one thing that like I was involved involved in in these hash wars in the past, and I've and I've been a Bitcoin miner in the past, and so um, something that really that comes to my mind constantly is we need to really protect these networks that we love. We need to really uh, make sure that we have as many people possible protecting these networks with their hash power. Um, is it easier to be, uh, to be, uh, attacked in, in, by having someone else, let's say mine orphan blocks on, on Monero and, 
Is that is that is that is, is does does random X make it harder for someone to mine empty blocks on the network than um, if we didn't have it? No, I don't think the particular algorithm changes that that question. You know, it's it's just the answer to that question is just about the total hash rate. You know, no matter what kind of hash it is, it's just the numbers you've got. Do you have fifty one percent or don't you? You know. Once you have 51%, then you can start orphaning blocks at a rate that impacts all the other miners. And that it just doesn't matter what the algorithm is. Of course, because you know RandomX runs on CPUs, it means you know the attackers and the defenders have easy access to more resources if they want them, right? If if it was ASICs only and the network was being attacked and you could only get ASICs from one or two companies, you know, you'd have a much harder time to mount new hash rate, right? Because these companies are fairly restrictive in, in how they actually sell their hardware. So, you know, if, you know, if there's an attack that you see ongoing and you say, Hey, I want to buy, you know, a thousand more ASICs to defend against this attack, you know, that's going to be a much harder job than it would be to say, Oh, it looks like, you know, somebody is using Azure to attack the network again. Well, we can go and rent a thousand nodes on AWS and counter that, right? So that's a lot easier because RandomX gives us more potential platforms to run. Thank you. Thank you very much for the answer. And for those listening, um, I need to tell you guys that I don't prepare these questions in advance. I, I, I'm, I'm here going with the flow and, I, and these questions come up on the spot. And for the sake of clarity, my last question, I was referring to an attack where you mine empty blocks and you orphan valid ones. That's what I was referring to. What are you excited for right now in Monero? Like, uh, what, what is it right now that when you look at Monero, you're like, wow, this is really cool. This is something that really excites me for the future. You know, the, the coolest thing that I've seen recently is uh, Triptych. Have you been hearing about that? Yes. Could you please explain uh, Triptych to those uh, listening? It's a, it's a new transaction mechanism that would uh, replace the current ring CT mechanism. And it allows us to have ring sizes um, much larger than current. You know, it's been demonstrated with a ring size of 128 members versus the 11 that we currently use. And so it's, it's kind of magical because it allows these much larger ring sizes without using much larger block size. You know, so there's, there's some really cool tech there. And uh, I think that's going to have a huge impact because the, the gain in privacy is just going to be, you know, terrific just from that. And for the sake of the layman listening, uh, could you please, uh, you know, expound some clarity here on this, on this next topic. A lot of rival chains to Monero are, are talking about anonymity sets. Right. Does does the ring size itself uh, correlate on a one to one ratio to the anonymity set, or is anonymity an anonymity set something that you calculate differently? Yeah, it's different. It's you know the ring size is an element of the anonymity set, but uh, it the, a single ring isn't the total story. You know the because the rings uh, propagate forward and backward in time. You know the anonymity set depends on the, the point in time that you're analyzing. You know, and so the further back that you move in time, the larger the set gets. Oh, wow. So are you saying that this compounds over time? It does, yes. Oh, wow. That's that's really interesting. I did not know that. So um, is what would you say um, right now, Monero as it is right now with a ring signature size of 11 and then... I mean, obviously, uh, confidence and sort of transactions and stealth addresses with all of that combined. Do, do you have like a ballpark? Because, again, this anonymity sec notion has been tossed around a lot. And, and, it's, and it's, it's almost like I hear contention, but I ask myself, do these people even know what they're talking about? And 
how do they even reach these conclusions? So if you were to give an anonymity set number from Monero at, at the present moment, where are we? <laughs> well, okay, it's, um, it's not a directly comparable number and, and it depends on you know, the, the age of the transaction. So there is, uh, there is a point where Monero is relatively vulnerable you know, and uh, if you've heard or, or if you've seen like the Breaking Monero series, it might be called an EAE attack or the NAC attack. And that's basically where, um, you know, you do a transaction from an exchange to your wallet and then you go uh, from your wallet to, to someone else's wallet and then they go directly back to the same exchange that it, that it all started from. And in that case, you know, the transactions are only one hop removed from the exchange. So from the exchange's point of view, the anonymity set is always just 10 or 11, all right? Um, it hasn't propagated at all because the exchange has seen both ends of that uh, chain of transactions. And so in that case, the exchange always has a very good idea, you know, high probability that it knows what the real uh, outputs are. And so in that case, if, if we put triptych into that picture and we say the ring size is now 128, you know, that makes things um, not just 12 times or whatever harder for them. You know, it's actually you know, 144 times or 1,000 times harder as, as you go from hop to hop. So that is the, uh, the minimal ring size where the attack is the easiest is right in that scenario, exchange to wallet to wallet to exchange. And for everything else where, you know, where you go from one wallet to another wallet and you never go back to the original source, you know, then the anonymity set is just uh, astronomical. Wow. Thank you. Thank you so much for clarifying that. Wow. Um, so 128 uh, ring signature size. That's wow. That's one heck of an increase from what we we're at now. Yeah. That's incredible. <laughs> I'm just flabbergasted. I did not know that number was that. That's what we were looking at. That's incredible. So right now there is a rival cryptocurrency that is gaining momentum. And maybe you've heard of it. It's Pirate Chain. And they are Zcash with with the Z address, pretty Z address uh, by default, right? right. Um, have you looked into it? Thoughts about Pirate Chain? Uh, I haven't looked at it closely. You know, they, they're still using um, basically unmodified Zcash code. So they still have a trusted setup. And, you know, that in itself uh, discounts it immediately from my perspective. You know, if you, I think they actually in... upgraded alongside with like, uh, what was it? The, they, they, that is still a point of contention, so I'm not even going to get into it right now. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Let's right. just not go there. But yeah, you're right. That is That has always been a, a critique of, of, of Zcash and uh, Pirate Chain at this moment, yes. And, you know, I mean, that's, you know, the, what, is, what is the point? Why are we doing cryptocurrency, right? That we are doing this so we don't need to trust anyone else. No trusted third parties, you know. And, and so you're throwing that concept away when you say, oh, here's this crypto for you, but it has a trusted setup. You know, it's like you, you've defeated the purpose of using cryptography in the first place. Anyway, okay, so we'll leave the, leave the rest of that alone. <laughs> okay, sounds good, sounds good. Yeah, um, I, think, I think there was a new um, uh, trusted setup uh, kind of ceremony, and this one was of 81 entities. I think you, I don't know exactly the term that was used for that. So mm -hmm. it's, um, yeah, it's, it was, it, there is, um, so it's the original trusted setup had was a lot more vulnerable. Uh, right. the one that's hap that happened since it has, I, 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 if I remember correctly, it was 81. So it's, it's definitely not as vulnerable as the first one. So I think that's where we're at with that one in regards to pirate chain and even, uh, Zcash it's, it, itself. So, but I agree with you. Yes, that's always going to be a point of, um, of, of contention. 
So what are you working on now, Howard? Uh, I know that you have your own project right now. And uh, yeah, we would like to, I know it, it has to be something cool. Because, I mean, we talked about <laughs> LMBD. We talked about uh, Random X. What are you working on now? So, uh, you know, mostly, I mean, I work full time on Open LDAP, which is, you know, another open source software project. It's a network database. And actually, Open LDAP is the project that, uh, that uh, prompted me to write LMDB. You know, Open LDAP is the, the first use case for LMDB, you know, back in 2011. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a distributed database you know, with a hierarchical data model. And, you know, it's aimed at workloads that are heavy on reads and lighter on writes. You know, so more read oriented traffic. You know, the typical users of directories um, or where the technology comes from is from the telephone industry. You know, and that, that remains the, the probably the number one use case for this technology. You know, every, te every telephone network, every mobile phone network in the world uses LDAP underneath. You know, um, so some of the big names that, uh, that you might know of, you know, in, in the US, you know, Verizon and T-Mobile and AT&T, you know, they're all using LDAP. They're all using open LDAP, in fact. Um, you know, and a bunch of the big networks in Europe as well, uh, lots of the networks in Asia. You know, uh, it is the world's fastest distributed database technology. It has been since 2003. So, you know, for 18 years, we've been the world's fastest. And, uh, you know, with the creation of LMDB, you know, we, we pushed our performance scaling even further. Wow, that's, that uh, sounds pretty in intense. Obviously, yeah, it's, that's it's not. Cool I, I'm I'm not in that world, so I wouldn't I wouldn't know what to comment about it. So, well, yeah, uh, thank you for sharing that. That's that seems pretty like pretty cool stuff. What what do you see as like like the biggest challenge that Monero has moving forward? Huh. Well, I would say you know the the regulatory landscape still looks you know rocky. I mean, we've. We've seen, you know, there's the Perkins Coy white paper that shows that Monero can be fully compliant with uh, currency regulations, financial regulations, but, you know, we're seeing exchanges being skeptical or hesitant and that sort of thing. So I'd say there's a lot of uncertainty remaining there. You know, um, a lot of people are you know, there's there's this big conspiracy theory that I don't know what to make of that that says that Monero's price in the markets is being artificially suppressed, uh, and you know that, like I said, it sounds like tinfoil hat stuff. You know, but if you look on you know some of these ex these exchanges, uh, you can see the short interest in Monero is huge. It's like, you know, seventeen to one, and for any other cryptocurrency, it's like you know, 0.5 to one. So the the weight of these short bids is just enormous compared to what's normal for the crypto market. I agree. And um, I was looking for my tinfoil hat, but I can't find it right now. <laughs> so I'm going to be as, uh, <laughs> but yes, I, <laughs> I agree with you. I, I speak with a lot of people that actually run exchanges that are CEO of exchanges. And they tell me this, they're like, Raf, we have a lot of people buying Monero and that's a lot uh, it's always a a way bigger number than selling Monero I've had exchanges tell me I have people buying Monero I have no one selling Monero hmm. that, that's been actually I, that was uh someone that I interviewed here that they said that Andres Brecken okay. of Sa a side AI said that I have people buying Monero I have no one selling Monero so you know I honestly I think I think these exchanges are are a problem to crypto in general and these KYC ML exchanges and I, and I'm really excited for all these um decentralized exchanges um I know recently I think just a couple uh, less than 24 hours ago Havano uh, exchange was launched do you know about Havano like I've I've just seen the announcement like like you have I'm sure yeah uh, it looks yeah. like a great initiative. Um, you know, they've taken the BISC code and 
uh, rewritten the Bitcoin parts out of it and added Monero in as the base currency, I think that's that's terrific. And it's you know it's a super logical thing to do. It's something that Monero needs. You know, and distributed ex exchanges are obviously the right way forward. You know, getting away from these centralized KYC AML exchanges, like you mentioned. You know, definitely, yeah. So even even every every privacy enthusiast out there out there, even the the when you talk to like the pirate chain guys, they they see Monero as their like gold standard. And whenever they talk about building like a a decentralized exchange in the future, they always see Monero as like the leading cryptocurrency within even if within within a platform that they would they themselves would build. So that shows you how like. Monero is really like the digital gold in cryptocurrency and it is the standard and it's mind-boggling to me how undervalued it is in the market right now. It's it, it makes I I my tin foil hat I'm I'm looking for it because it <laughs> makes no sense. It makes no sense. Right. Yeah. It makes no sense. And yeah, I I can't say anything else besides that, you know, makes no sense. I'm happy we agree on that <laughs> because <laughs> so it's not me. It's not just me. I guess, I guess we both, uh, yeah, I both, I, I got, hopefully, uh, you know, the lockdowns end and we have another Monero con and then we can all just walk in with our tinfoil hats and recognize <laughs> one another from there afar. Go, yeah. Right. <laughs> Howard, yeah. thank you so much for being with us and uh, thank you for your time and, you gave us a lot to think about. I know this comment section is 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 uh, is going to go crazy. Um, I man, when I talk to to guys like you, um, I wish I had another Raphael here doing more thinking with me, so that I can have <laughs> more questions to ask you. Because I know the moment that we hang up, I'm gonna have like. 30 questions lined up. I'm like, man, I should have asked him this. I should have asked him that. So I'm going to have to invite you again. I'm just letting you know. I'm going to have to invite you again. And <laughs> and so, yeah. When do you think, when is, uh, what's, where's the status on Triptych right now? Uh, I don't know that it's actively being integrated yet, but, um, you know, the code seems to be fairly mature. So it's in pretty good shape. And who's behind that? That's Sarang, right? Sarang Nolder? Yeah, that's right. Okay, right on. That's uh, I. I thought he was on vacation. <laughs> <laughs> I, guess, I guess he couldn't stay idle for too long. You know, right? you get bored when you go away. <laughs> Hilarious. I love these guys. Like all these, all these people. For all you watching right now, you have to understand that th that this is a work of love. And a lot of these guys, a lot of them don't even have to work anymore, but they can't keep themselves from working because they love this so much. <laughs> and, and by any, you know, by all means, I'm trying to, to, to make things as comprehensible for all you watching. And, uh, I mean, I, I commend you guys for all the work that you do. Thank you so much, Howard, for everything that you've done. And I'm definitely going to have you again soon. <laughs> Thanks, Raphael. Thanks for having me on. Have a good one. Peace, love, anarchy, guys. Stay safe out there. Look yourself in the mirror and remember that the most important person in all of Monero is you. Thank you very mm -hmm. much, Howard. Thanks, sir.